Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here we have the final uh, concluding session of this year's 29th annual Arab-US uh, Policy Makers uh, Conference. And we couldn't have two more distinguished, uh, experienced, uh, highly educated uh, professionals, foreign affairs practitioners uh, to bring uh, our discussions and deliberations and disagreements and debates uh, full circle uh, and on a note on which to leave, to leave. And of course, for both of you, we've been trying to examine the implications of the uh, most recent presidential elections for uh, U.S. relations with the Arab region. Of course, uh, and you uh, have been a teacher of this concept, uh, Ragina. You don't use the word Arab world, you refer to Arab region, so you persuaded me. So the Arab region and the Middle East and the Islamic world, they're interrelated, interconnected, but they are also distinctly and profoundly different. Um, but it's the Arab component of it because there are 22 Arab countries. There's only one Iran, one Turkey, one Israel, one Pakistan, one Afghanistan, but 22 Arab countries, 28 Middle Eastern countries, and 57 uh, members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Um, and that is the Islamic world's uh, highest political organization. Uh, General David Petraeus uh, is a member of the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations International Advisory Board. And we, uh, we are lucky to uh, have him agree to do that because this individual's timing, energies, and creative efforts are stretched thin uh, so to speak. And you'll understand why and how if I just mention a few aspects about his extraordinary uh, biography. And I, I try not to read these things uh, to have uh, as good an eye contact as I possibly can and the chemistry that goes with it. Uh, only uh, I am aware of what I forgot to say. And so will uh, General Petraeus and Ragada as well. General Petraeus had a distinguished career in the United States uh, military. He's the only uh, American uh, Armed Forces officer to get the highest ranking uh, score in the U.S. Army Ranger School, which involves being a parachutist, amongst many other uh, uh, extraordinarily difficult skills to master or acquire and also at the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College. Uh, these are two feats that have not been equaled uh, by others, but that's not all. Uh, uh, very few uh, U.S. Army four-star generals, there are some others, but very few, you can almost count them on your fingers of your hand, one hand at that, who have also received their PhD and not yet at any uh, sort of community college or a freshwater college, but rather at Princeton University, uh, where I was privileged to be able to study Arabic. He received his uh, PhD in international relations and economics. Now, many have uh, international relations as a degree, but not as many uh, link it also to economics. So it's not surprising that he uh, is a partner of KKR International, uh, which is a major investor, a major player in the U.S. commercial uh, trade and investment uh, dynamics and relations, not just between the United States and its Arab friends, Arab uh, allies, Arab partners, but uh, throughout the world, uh, Western uh, Europe, uh, uh, North America generally, Central America, South America, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, in uh, East Asia as such. Uh, so he's very much in demand uh, for his uh, insights and his advice. Now, what kinds of insights and advice? Those, uh, because he's been at the tip of the spear in uh, five different command, uh, uh, general command positions uh, in, in combat. And so he's got many uh, decorations, both from the United States as well as uh, a dozen or more uh, other countries that have acknowledged and been aware and appreciative of his contributions uh, to world affairs. Now, imagine this, that after his retirement from the military, he received a vote of 94 to zero in the U.S. Uh, Senate uh, as the director of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. 
uh, I'm unaware of anyone uh, achieving that vote of confidence and trust and vote of competence on top of confidence and trust. Uh, General Petraeus has, has now spoken several times at the National Council's annual Arab-US policymakers conference. And to uh, interview him, uh, have a discussion with him, a uh, conversation with him, it's, a, it's a guaranteed to be dynamic. Neither is ever asleep at the wheel or idling at the intersection there. Uh, with regard uh, to uh, Ragida uh, Dirham, who's also been much uh, acknowledged and uh, aware and uh, appreciated by a large segment of those who follow international affairs and foreign relations. For the longest time, she was the doyen or the dean of the uh, foreign correspondents at the United Nations in, in New York. Uh, she's been uh, awarded uh, recognition as uh, within the top 50 uh, uh, Arab women uh, leaders on an annual basis. And uh, on one occasion, she was acknowledged as number one uh, Arab uh, women's leader. So what a role model. And on top of that, she is a, f a founder and director of the Beirut Institute, which has been holding annual uh, seminars. Uh, in Abu Dhabi uh, and elsewhere. Uh, but due to the pandemic, of course, these have not had the same virtuality as before or in other occasions. But uh, on a bi-weekly basis, um, starting last spring, going right straight through uh, uh, May, June, and July, taking a, a breather in August, and then back on her feet, running up hill again in September, usually with four people. Uh, of diverse backgrounds, diverse nationalities, diverse ethnicities, and diverse uh, areas of expertise. Ragada uh, Durham, uh, we're fortunate indeed to have you with us once again, and for you and David Petraeus to, to have a go at it. Uh, you, you have the floor, uh, Ragada. Thank you so very much for this privilege. Thank you very much, Jean Duc. Anthony for the uh, tradition now that allows me to have a conversation with General Petraeus. It's been uh, three, it's our third year, and hopefully next year it will be your 30th anniversary, I think. So hopefully the tradition will continue in, uh, in, 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 as it was before, live rather than virtual. So good luck to you and congratulations on a very successful conference so far. We want to congratulate with your, under your leadership, of course, always, Patrick Mancino, who has been really an amazing um, pillar in, 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 in making sure that these annual conferences are successful. General Petraeus, what an honor, the privilege to have the chance to have the next 40 minutes uh, of a conversation with you, because I always learn a lot from you. And I thank you for being such a great supporter of both in Kusar and of Beirut Institute. So uh, with this, I will start by asking you, General Petraeus, so is it a done deal now with the elections? Uh, is it over? Are we now clearly with the president-elect called Joe Biden or uh, are, are you expecting surprises all the way from now till the 20th of January? Well, first of all, thanks uh, very much to John Duke uh, for the invitation to be back with the National Council. Uh, it's always, it's, as you note, it has become an annual tradition to do this with you, uh, Ragida, and I thank you uh, for that as well. Um, you know, I would probably defer to the legal experts on what might still be done, but it sure seems to me that, um, you know, if, as they say, the fat lady has not yet sung, she has certainly been clearing her, her throat for quite some time. Um, all of the major news organizations, which are very, very careful before announcing uh, a projection of victory, have indeed done just that. Uh, there appear to be no serious allegations of the kind of fraud that would overturn one of the elections. You've had the recount in the state that was the closest of all, Georgia hand recount, uh, and the outcome is still what it was uh, with uh, President-elect Biden um, taking that state. 
and even if there's a machine recount. So again, I, I just don't see any prospect for uh, uncertainty here at this point in time. Um, and as I have noted before, <clears throat> as General Jack Keane, uh, who's uh, very respected by President Trump, in fact, he was awarded the National Medal of Freedom uh, by the president for his work after leaving uniform, noting that he was a major mentor of mine. But he, as he used to say when he was a two-star general, uh, and I was privileged to be his chief of operations plans and training in the great 101st Airborne Division, he used to tell uh, battalion and brigade commanders, if you really love your unit, you will actually get out of the unit uh, before your incoming uh, replacement arrives so he can move into the office immediately, move into your house immediately uh, and be welcome in the area so that when he actually or she takes the colors of that organization in the change of command ceremony, uh, the entire focus of the new commander can be on the unit rather than on hanging pictures at home or in the office or what have you. And I would submit that the same is true uh, really when it comes to our country and it's long since time that we got on with uh, allowing the kind of proper transition that has taken place even when there have been serious disputes uh, such as in the case of the uh, Florida election which where the recounts in a very, very close uh, margin ultimately a victory for President George W. Bush. Uh, but by the way, the 9-11 Commission uh, that was a bipartisan uh, process did conclude that some of the uncertainty and the delay in the transition in from the Clinton to the Bush administration may have resulted in some of the failures to connect the dots as it is said uh, to put together the various pieces of intelligence that the uh, FBI had or the CIA had or other elements of the intelligence and law enforcement communities to connect and identify what became the perpetrators of the 9-11 attack. So mm -hmm. there are potentially serious consequences if the transition is not sufficient and complete, uh, noting that, of course, no one has been as experienced as President-elect Biden, eight years as the vice president, decades in the Senate and so forth in, in key positions uh, with, a, with a team that is going to come into government that is very, very experienced as well. General Petraeus, talk to me about the serious consequences that you just mentioned. What does that mean? What, what happens to the country if we do get to the 20th of January and things are not going in the way that you wish them to go? What price will the country pay? Where will well, we what, be? What go President ahead. elect Biden has said quite pointedly is that more people will die because, again, the crisis that faces the country right now is not that which ultimately manifested itself in the 9-11 attacks, uh, a terrorist attack. I don't see the kind of capability out there resident in Al Qaeda or the Islamic State or, or other would-be uh, terrorist entities. Uh, the threat is at home right now. It is the pandemic. And the response to the pandemic has been patchwork. It has not been uh, adequate, clearly. I mean, it, it, is, it defies logic to say that it has been adequate if you have 250,000 Americans uh, who have died. We are approaching, still some way from it, but approaching the number of individuals who lost their lives in combat in World War II to give some perspective to how significant a number this is. Um, and clearly, uh, when the new administration takes over, uh, we want to be absolutely certain uh, that the incoming team is completely uh, up to speed on how the process and logistics and activities associated with administering the vaccines, uh, how all of that will work. Uh, to be completely up to speed <clears throat> in the details of that. I mean, there's been very heartening news in, in the course of the last week that there are two vaccines <clears throat> with an efficacy that is roughly 95% or thereabouts, which is extraordinary, way beyond what the hopes were. Mm -hmm. But that is not the challenge. The challenge is <clears throat> how to mass produce, put in bottles, <clears throat> vials, and then of course administer, noting that the Pfizer vaccine has to be kept at very, very low temperatures 
um, yes. or it loses its potency. So that's, that's just right. one example. And again, it was Vice President or is it President Biden, President elect Biden, who used the words, more people will die if there is not an efficient and effective and complete transition process. Mm -hmm. Right. Can I ask, uh, General, two questions. How difficult can President Trump make the life of President-elect Biden if he continues to challenge the validity of this, of this election? And I want to combine this with another question. What if the Senate goes Republican? Uh, do you think this is going to cripple the ability of the Biden administration to perform, including, for example, uh, confirming uh, nominations. Tell me about uh, that angle of the Senate and particularly through the Georgia uh, recount. Well, look, I'm not, you know, the expert on domestic politics and I'd rather defer to those that are, but since you asked the questions before we get onto the areas that are a bit more my normal expertise, uh, foreign policy, security affairs, and so forth. Um, I think, again, what is being done right now is obviously not only just making the transition difficult, right now it is making it impossible because until the uh, individual in the government services administration makes the uh, assessment and signs the document, that allows the transition process to begin, um, it will not actually formally begin and you will not have the release of funds, the provision of office space, the authorization of landing teams to go into the various departments and agencies of the executive branch, uh, and also the receipt of classified briefings and so forth. Ironically, the vice president-elect right now is receiving intelligence briefings because she's a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. The president-elect, however, is not. Um, and so again, a number of these uh, issues clearly uh, need to be resolved, but they cannot until you have that uh, attestation or what have you that the GSA has to make. Um, clearly, there, there would be a difference in the realm of the possible, one would assume, um, if the Senate remains in Republican hands, uh, uh, either through winning one or both of the seats that are still to be contested in early January in the state of Georgia. And obviously that will um, create wrinkles for a <clears throat> democratically led executive branch uh, even though the House is Democratic, and when it comes to confirmation of cabinet officials, um, it could reduce uh, the possibilities in some respects uh, for the president, <clears throat> once he assumes office, to nominate individuals. Um, and obviously, when it comes to a variety of different policies, this would be a, a constraint at the least. And depending on how much bipartisan activity uh, can be achieved. It could be even beyond that. Uh, we know from experience what can happen if uh, a Senate uh, just does not want to allow a president to have legislative achievements. One would hope that that is something in the rearview mirror and that the most experienced uh, former senator to be the president in the form of President Biden would figure out how to get uh, his agenda pursued at least in, in considerable part by working with his former colleagues in the Senate uh, from the Republican side of the aisle. Gotcha. Uh, Jan Petraeus, we, uh, you're used to me doing ping pong conversation with you. So I'm gonna take you to your area of expertise. And since we have a lot of foreign, uh, foreign affairs and uh, foreign policy issues to cover, I know China is a priority, but I wanna start with Russia. Russia seems to be going through a tough time. Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, seems to be surrounded by problems from everywhere, including even Syria, where he's not feeling very well in his skin. And he's got trouble with Raja Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, and he's got, uh, you know, from Georgia to, to Moldova. He's in a bit of trouble. How is this going to uh, impact the relationship of Russia with the United States in a Biden presidency? What do you see? And I'm gonna just go through Russia quickly, uh, and then I'm okay, gonna- let me, let me just answer on Russia first. 
Uh, look, I think that there will be a different relationship between the U.S. Uh, and Russia over what we have seen uh, in recent years, um, where in some ways there was the traditional kind of activity, uh, which was to push back against Russian uh, invasion in, in parts of Georgia, Ukraine, uh, intimidation of the Baltic states and a variety of other activities uh, in Syria, Libya, you name it. Um, but there has been undeniably uh, a reluctance in the White House to take some of the actions against Russia, particularly uh, when it involves some of the interference that they undertook in the previous presidential election, when they sought to inflame the existing differences in our society, and also reportedly to put a finger on the scales of that particular election. Um, so there will not be that kind of um, uh, presence uh, in this particular foreign policy. And, and in this, in the Biden administration, you can expect certainly that there will be a renewed embrace of alliances, of partnerships, even while insisting that uh, alliance partners of NATO do meet the 2% of GDP spent on defense uh, objective that was established at the Wales summit uh, of NATO some years back. Um, and also that there will be an embrace of climate change once again, a return to Paris, uh, the climate accord, uh, a continued presence in the World Health Organization, and indeed uh, working through multilateral and international uh, institutions and organizations. And that will include uh, Russia, as well as presumably the coherent and comprehensive whole of government's approach that one would expect uh, for the most important relationship in the world, which would be the U.S. and China as well. There will also be a renewed emphasis. There will also be a renewed emphasis on human rights, uh, which has not featured that prominently <clears throat> in recent years. And so I think you can expect quite a few differences um, in general, and then specifically when it comes to the U.S. with Russia, also the U.S. with some of the other countries around the world um, in, as well. So on Russia and Syria, let me, the Obama administration doesn't have a very good legacy in, uh, uh, in its uh, policies towards Syria. Some in the administration later on in the Obama administration regretted some things that were done or not done for Syria. How do you see a Biden administration dealing with Syria? Uh, is it going to uh, sort of be an extension of the Obama administration's policies there? And, uh, and, and particularly in as far as, you know, how do you see Russia is doing in Syria? Iran is doing in Syria. How do you find, uh, uh, give, give us- a, a, hey, one, one question at a time, please, Ragida. Okay. Um, so when it comes to uh, a Biden administration in Syria, I think you are accurate in saying that even members of that administration look back on Syria and ask whether they could have done certain things better. Uh, it is a, at least according to Hillary Clinton's book and Leon Panetta's book and others, uh, when I was CIA director, they had <clears throat> report that I made certain recommendations about what might have been done and decisions were not made <clears throat> to indeed to follow those recommendations. It's hard to imagine the situation could have been worse than what resulted, uh, although certainly there were never assurances that uh, the objectives of some of what might have been could have been achieved. But ultimately, I think you do have to give the Obama-Biden administration credit for returning U.S. forces to Iraq, putting them into Syria. Uh, in the case of Syria, building the Syrian Democratic Forces uh, in northeastern Syria uh, and enabling those forces to defeat the Islamic State as an army uh, controlling a caliphate and obviously to eliminate that caliphate and to do the same uh, in support of Iraqi forces in uh, the land of the two rivers. So I think that is not a trivial uh, achievement. Certainly the final destruction of 
the caliphate was conducted under the current administration, which did take some, some intelligent uh, initiatives as well in terms of pushing decision-making authority down, uh, eliminating some of the overly restrictive use of air power, although that was a bit more an Afghan uh, issue and modestly increasing the number of resources devoted uh, to Iraq and Syria. But of course, in more recent times, there has been the pull out and the pull put back uh, and so forth. My hope would be <clears throat> that the effort to end endless wars, which is very understandable and no one wants that more than a former soldier, especially one who commanded those wars, but that it would be done as candidate Biden said, responsibly. And I think that the way to continue our efforts in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and a number of other countries is to achieve, is to make a sustained commitment that's very, very necessary for the dynamics of those particular countries and situations that they recognize that the US is there to stay until some political or other uh, uh, arrangement is agreed but that that commitment is sustainable in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure. So you have a sustained, sustainable commitment. That is very necessary in Northeastern right. Syria, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where obviously without us, uh, the regime forces supported by Russia and the Hezbollah of Iran uh, and the Quds Force and so forth, and perhaps in in other respects, uh, Turkish forces would very quickly uh, compete to reassert control over the areas of the Syrian Kurds and also those Syrian Sunni Arabs that are in that northeastern uh, area of uh, Syria, roughly northeast of uh, the Euphrates River. Uh, and then you also have the enclave down at the Iraq-Syria uh, border crossing, which we also need to sustain. Again, that would be my hope. And based on the statements, again, of candidate Biden saying that, yes, we want to end endless wars, but to do it responsibly, I, I think that's not a vain hope. Uh, I think it could materialize as a policy, keeping in mind that, that there were lessons learned from the Obama-Biden administration when we withdrew all of our combat forces from Iraq, only to have the prime minister of Iraq then pursue highly ruinous sectarian policies that alienated the Sunni Arabs that we had fought to get back into the fabric of society and had done that together, by the way, with that same prime minister, uh, and then violently put down peaceful demonstrations and completely overlooked the fact that that was allowing uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, then by then the Islamic State to reconstitute itself and of course, to gain additional power in Syria and eventually establish the caliphate that uh, included substantial parts of Northern Iraq and Northeastern Syria. General, I have so <coughs> many, so much ground to cover, but a quick question, uh, I'll try to be very precise on this one. Do you think the Biden administration uh, will or should go ahead uh, and sustain, maintain the sanctions that the Trump administration has imposed on Syrian officials? I think they'll think very, very hard about that and uh, when it comes to the Syrian officials to see what the removal of that might gain if it is to restart some kind of negotiation uh, to ultimately reach a negotiated settlement of the Syria issue. The challenge, as you know, has been that the various parties to what really was a civil war um, have never been sufficiently close uh, or at times even in the same room where the supposed negotiations were being uh, supported by Russia or what have you, right. uh, that they are within reach of a, a reasonable negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, one reason that I believe a sustained commitment that is sustainable is necessary is to signal to Bashar al-Assad and his murderous regime and those who are supporting him, um, that the US is fine about staying there uh, because again, it is a sustainable commitment in terms of blood and treasure, uh, unless there is a reasonable political solution 
that could be durable uh, and would be verifiable <clears throat> and would include safeguards in case its provisions were violated. So let me, uh, I know you want to speak about China and I want to speak about China. I just was wondering if I should just continue. Have to stay in the Middle East. This is the National yeah. Council on US-Arab Relations. Yes, so. let's stay in the Middle East and I'll conclude with China. So if you don't mind if, uh, that I do that. So that takes me directly to Iran. In fact, China can be part of this question because there's been a pact between China and Iran that signed for 25 years, I believe. And, uh, and, uh, and there's been a lot of talk now about the potential and apparently, allegedly, there are talks going on between <coughs> Iranian officials as, and the Biden team to assure them that there will be a return to the JCPOA, there will be a lifting of sanctions. And, uh, and uh, sources tell me, I don't know uh, if you have the same uh, assessment, that the Iranians are feeling quite good and confident about things going uh, their way uh, with the Biden presidency. Uh, do you think it's wise, General Petraeus, to just uh, lift sanctions right away and then talk about it? Well, I think as always, it's worth revisiting the JCPOA, uh, recalling the uh, the good features and also the not so good features. Um, I mean, we should acknowledge that the nuclear agreement did eliminate all of the medium enriched uranium. <clears throat> it eliminated 98 or 99 percent of low enriched uranium. It dramatically reduced the number of centrifuges spinning. It eliminated the plutonium path to a bomb. It turned the deeply buried hardened uh, site in Fordo uh, into a research facility. <clears throat> and it had a reasonably intrusive inspection uh, mechanism that still does function to this day and is telling us, of course, that there are worrisome developments taking place in the uh, nuclear program of Iran, which is once again uh, enriching and carrying on activities that it had stopped doing uh, and continued to stop doing until the sanctions were imposed by the United States. <clears throat> now, of course, there were some downsides to the agreement. They did not address the missile program, which has been more and more worrisome to our, our own forces, to our partners and allies uh, in the region, not just the Gulf states, but all the way reaching as far as, as Israel. Um, and of course, it did nothing about the so-called malign activity, which has been so concerning over the years, uh, and is an element of Iran's pursuit of hegemony over the Shia Crescent uh, from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, down into Southern Lebanon, uh, and the, the efforts to Lebanonize Iraq and Syria. In other words, to uh, establish very powerful militias on the streets, such as you have in, in Lebanon with Hezbollah, and then to achieve very powerful, ideally veto-proof uh, blocks in the legislature, uh, in the Council of Representatives in, in Baghdad, similar to what uh, the Hezbollah coalition has been able to achieve uh, in yeah. Beirut. So again, all of this is sort of the context in which this takes place. Uh, and I am not, oh, and, and also I should absolutely mention the end dates, the sunset clauses for various elements of the agreement, uh, right. after which uh, Iran's uh, agreement or embrace of the non-proliferation treaties additional protocol, which we're not sure they will in fact follow uh, and, and, and agree and obey, if you will. So there is an uncertainty and these various components start ending around the 10-ish timeframe right. from the date of signature. Well, that's, you know, that date of signature was five or six years ago. So those end dates are much closer now and much more worrisome now. So Absolutely. it's not necessarily the right answer to just return to that agreement if in fact the Iranians will return to the agreement, which is not assured. Um, who has the whip hand in Iran when it comes to this? Is it the deep state, the security state, which runs so much of the country, or is it the visible state, uh, which is facing elections uh, next year and probably we'll see a more hardline figure than the current elected president uh, of the country 
um, who of course has gone through an experience where he agreed with the Americans only to have uh, that agreement uh, not honored, even though they did not violate uh, the JCPO in any significant manner. So again, I, I'm not sure that this is a given. Uh, so clearly there's going to have to be a process of, again, returning to the negotiating table. There could be some kind of freeze for a freeze that I have discussed with you in the right. past is one of the options that in fact, the current administration might have adopted just to stop the alarming development in the nuclear program for now, uh, while we stop or peel off some of the sanctions, uh, but by no means all. And again, do we want to return wholeheartedly to an agreement whose end dates are approaching and would fall during, some of them would fall during the uh, current administration's term and which it does nothing about the other co components of Iranian activity that are so worrisome the missile and malign activity. So again, this is a much more complex issue, I think, in many respects than just saying, okay, you know, if we lift the sanctions, will you return? Um, I'm not sure that is advisable. And I'm not even sure that, again, uh, the, the visible state in Iran has that authority <clears throat> at this point in time and given the experience and the approach of elections next year. Would you advise the Biden administration to uh, correct the wrongs that were done in the first set of negotiations for the JCPOA? Not only the administration, uh, Obama administration, it was the five permanent members plus Germany who agreed to not include what you call the malign activities of uh, uh, Iran in, uh, in, in the neighborhood, uh, in the Middle East, in the Arab geography. And precisely. So is it, would you advise the Biden administration to just say, no, yes, at this point, we cannot allow the goodwill that was you know, shown to you in the hope that you would do better, uh, and then in, insist that these activities, that the regional uh, ambitions of Iran are on the table when there is the rediscussion of the JCPOA, including the, uh, the, the very important details you mentioned. Well, the problem is, of course, that there was a hope <clears throat> that there would be goodwill shown on the Iranian side once the agreement was entered into force and sanctions were lifted and Iran was allowed to re-enter the global economy and export oil uh, and so forth, and that then they would be able to move on to address these other issues. But of course, that, never, that moment never arrived. And on the other hand, we are now, again, much closer to the sunset clauses, uh, as I noted, than we were, again, five or more years ago when the agreement was initially signed. I mean, let's face it, the, the Israeli defense chief at that time, senior military uh, Israeli figure, said that the JCPOA made Israel safer for 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. And again, there is a reason for that 10-year period. So uh, again, this is much more complex, I think, than it might appear on the surface. And, uh, and of course, if you're going to do anything with that JCPOA to reopen some aspects of it, that's a very significant step. <clears throat> no guarantee that Iran would be willing to do that. And of course, again, we have to get the P5 plus one, the permanent five members of the, uh, National, the United Nations Security Council plus uh, uh, the EU with us on this. Uh, How about Germany, not some so Arab countries, General? No, don't you think some Arab countries need to be in, not only EU uh, as part of this conversation? Or, uh, well, they certainly that? need to be part of the conversation. And as you well know, one hears repeatedly um, the disappointment from that period in the past when the negotiations were going on without them being made fully aware of them. So certainly there needs, they need to be included in, uh, informed along the way, uh, but I don't know that you would expand this beyond the P5 plus one, um, just because of the sheer logistical challenges of mm -hmm. adding additional countries to that. But that certainly being informed and having an opportunity to uh, provide their views as well, I think would be very, very well advised. 
General Petraeus, it seems that you're ruling out just a bilateral agreement between the United States and Iran. Or did I hear you correctly? Well, again, this was not a bilateral agreement. This was yeah. an, an agreement between the P5 plus one and Iran. So uh, now you could do a freeze for a freeze might be a bilateral agreement. But again, to truly Same get the JCPOA in force, we're going to have to get the P5 plus one back. Uh, and of course, there are other dynamics that affect um, Russia and China uh, that were not around in those days. So this is, again, uh, what I'm trying to lay out is that the complexities here are very considerable and much more considerable than are often laid out in some of the very short discussions that you get mm -hmm. in uh, some of the, uh, the, the media coverage of this. Before I, uh, I just want to ask you quickly about that China uh, Iran pact. Does it worry you? Do you think it's uh, a game changer uh, that China is uh, going to threaten the US via its relationship with Iran if things don't go right? Well, this is where you've got to come out quite a bit and again, understand the strategic context in which this might play out. Um, the most important relationship in the world by far is the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, that's recognized not just by the U.S. and China, but I assume by all the other countries in the world as well. Uh, it has, does a great deal to establish the geostrategic context uh, of uh, global geopolitics. And, and again, each country uh, the U.S. and China needs to consider what other activities with other countries might affect the state of the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, one presumes, again, that the incoming administration will try to achieve uh, what might be described as a coherent, comprehensive whole of governments approach with an S on the end, because it would be not just America first or alone, it would be America with our, all of our alliance and partner nations around the world to the extent that is possible. It would include international and multilateral uh, organizations and institutions and norms. <clears throat> it would hopefully include going back to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, although that might be a domestic political challenge uh, for an organization elected with the wholehearted support of the labor movement in the US, but not impossible and could be explained I would hope, um, but again, that relationship, which might be described as engage and influence or something along those lines <clears throat> is affected by all the other activities. <clears throat> so if China wants to do something with Iran, which enables Iran to circumvent uh, the sanctions that the US has imposed, that has an effect on the US-China relationship. Um, and again, if that's the most important relationship in the world for both countries, each of them therefore looks at every other foreign policy action that it takes mm -hmm. and looks at it through a prism, which mm -hmm. asks what will the effect be on the relationship that matters most to US-China. It's not China-Iran or US-Iran, frankly, for that matter. <clears throat> so in that regard, if you keep that in mind, you certainly should have reservations about what could result mm -hmm. from this, but I don't know that you would be, you know, overly worried um, <clears throat> that China is going to risk the rupture of the U.S.-China relationship yes. mm -hmm. uh, in order to import, I don't know, you know, twenty billion dollars worth of of oil uh, from Iran that otherwise would be sanctioned. That's and right. I think it's important to keep it in that particular perspective. But the sanctions uh, that we are hearing about that are coming up by the Trump administration against Iran, against Hezbollah, against individuals uh, in uh, Syria and Lebanon. And in fact, uh, we hear also some sanctions against China and Russia if they resume selling weapons to Iran and, and the Iranians are in a hurry to get more weapons. Is this not useful for President Biden to have this take, take it out of his way, that, that he could build on that rather than be- I mean, those, these are lots of hypotheticals. And in, in general, you want a period of transition 
um, to be a fairly steady state process, not one in which there's lots of new initiatives launched. Hmm. Um, but also, let's just recognize that there are limits to, again, what can be done <clears throat> in those respects uh, in that amount of time. Um, certainly, there will be a desire to pursue perhaps some additional initiatives uh, to, to pr in line with what has been done in the past. Um, but again, over time, on, again, at, at noon on January 20th, you have a new president. Uh, and if these previous actions were pursued by executive orders, uh, they can also be undone very easily by executive orders. And again, you're not going to do something major that has legislation attached to it, uh, given that Congress is only going to even be in session, I think, for perhaps another two weeks. And oh, by the way, I believe that one of the Democratic, uh, the incoming senators will actually assume his seat uh, prior to uh, the the normal uh, new administration. So again, uh, there is an awful lot of rhetoric out there and we'll see what ultimately is actually followed through. Would you advise the Biden administration to uh, uh, stick to the reset done by the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis its relationship, uh, the United States, the American, US relations with, with the Arab Gulf states? because there has been a serious reset and it's been an improved relationship. And there's a lot of fear that the Biden administration will sort of reset the reset and go back to the- Well, I, I think it's very hard to aggregate. Um, you know, it's difficult to aggregate the Mideast or even the Arab world or what have you. Uh, again, it's many different countries with many different features and and by the way, it's not the same uh, relationship in that region that existed four years ago. The Abraham Accords uh, that were uh, enabled by the U.S. administration with obviously the UAE, Bahrain, and uh, Israel, and now also Sudan, these are very significant achievements. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say a peace agreement because, again, none of these countries have ever been at war uh, with each other, but again, very, very significant. And they open up enormous uh, possibilities when it comes to trade, technology transfer, tourism, uh, a variety of different, uh, again, initiatives. Um, and indeed for the Palestinians, it ensured that is Israel's prime minister did not uh, annex all or part of the West Bank. Um, so, that's a very, very significant change in the context that the new administration will inherit, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and that will affect um, the possibilities in certain areas. I mean, you know, if you want to uh, sell arms, for example, to an Arab country, um, the best way to do that is to get the Israeli prime minister <laughs> his defense minister and his ambassador in Washington to support that activity on Capitol Hill, which is actually the case right now when it comes to selling the F-35 to uh, the UAE is something that I also strongly support. And as you have, will remember, I have noted that the uh, Emirati Air Force is more than capable of going head to head with the Iranian Air Force um, mm -hmm. if there's some AWACS and tankers provider or something like that. This is an Air Force that is not only proven in combat, and I was privileged to have uh, Emirati F-16s uh, flying for us in Afghanistan, uh, but it also goes head to head at the Gulf Air Warfare Training Center in a way that very few other countries' Air Forces uh, do. It's the equivalent of the red flag, blue flag process that we have out at Nellis Air Force Base uh, in the Nevada and California desert. Um, mm. So it is more than capable of handling the F-35. And again, it's not going to ever be used against Israel, which is, of course, why Israel's prime minister, defense minister and ambassador are all fully supportive of this. It would be focused east uh, mm. where we could use the help uh, potentially uh, if push ever does come to shove. And it also has a very significant uh, deterrent effect. Uh, as a result as well. So again, the dynamics in the region are very, very different uh, from what they were in the past. Although, as I noted earlier, there will be increased emphasis 
uh, on, uh, again, support for democracy around the world, support for human rights around the world, and a variety of other uh, mm -hmm. climate change, uh, multilateral institutions, international organizations, global solutions to global problems. Um, and all of those will be features uh, of the new administration, I think, that are they're going to be very obvious. So I think, uh, I think I have only 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Maybe somebody could give me uh, uh, some idea how long do I, I have? You have so about that's... seven minutes, but go ahead. Seven. No, then you got to speak a little. Then you have to give me shorter answers because I have well, You have very... to give me shorter questions. <laughs> Uh, no, I've been very good at this. So listen, General, uh, there's, uh, and I know you want to speak a lot about Iraq, but maybe we can make that very short, but I want to speak a lot about Turkey uh, is, uh, in the Biden, with the Biden administration. And, you know, uh, let me start with that. Do you think Rajab Tayyip Erdogan is going to be uh, happier with a Biden presidency? Uh, because the impression is that he was rather happy with the Trump presidency. And what would you advise Biden on Turkey? Well, first of all, by the way, I am not by any means a spokesperson for any administration, much less the incoming Biden administration. As you know, no, I am strictly nonpartisan, no, don't support no. candidates, uh, endorse or contribute or what have you. I do, however, know a lot of the people that will presumably be part of the administration. And I certainly know the president-elect uh, very, very well from his different positions over the years, including Senate Foreign Relations Chairman, Vice President, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I suspect that there will be um, a cooling to the relationship uh, between Washington and Ankara. Uh, again, this is another one where the incumbent administration occasionally turned a blind eye to some of the activities of Turkey. Uh, indeed, uh, made a decision after a, a conversation with uh, President Erdogan to pull all of our forces out of Syria, as you'll recall, which we did over the next 24 hours, and then uh, we're able to put them back in. So the the um, the inconsistency in that case was potentially uh, damaging. Uh, beyond that, I think the S-400 issue will be uh, more front and center now that Turkey has actually turned it on and tested it, uh, and that will, again, uh, eliminate any possibility of the sale of the F-35 and production of certain uh, components of the F-35 uh, in Turkey. We obviously have the complicating factors uh, of Syria where some of our objectives are aligned, some of the others are, are not so uh, aligned. Uh, there are issues uh, elsewhere in the region, uh, in Libya, uh, as well. And of course, the U.S. has done very little about Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, but again, yet another location where there, there, there is activity that, again, uh, may or may not find our administrations fully aligned. But I, I think in general that it will be a somewhat cooler relationship uh, than it has been over the past few years. Although I should note that you will recall that President Obama uh, famously felt that he had a very close relationship with President Erdogan throughout much uh, of certainly his first term in office uh, until over time, uh, I think there were reservations that started to accumulate. Uh, General Petraeus, will countries like Iraq, which you know very well, and Lebanon, where I am? On Iraqi. I am Lebanese. <laughs> so that, this question concerns both of us in that case. And do you think that these two countries will ever be normal uh, before the United States in particular addresses their issue through the prism of Iran in, in the sense that Iran needs to be told it's time to let those countries, these two countries be countries in, in respect of their uh, sovereignty and, and, and stop the interference and stop confiscating sure. the future. Yeah. Do you think that's doable? And again, I'm not telling you that you're spokesperson for the Biden administration. It's just that you're so knowledgeable about the region that in, if you were to give an advice, what would you say? Well, I think the prospects for normality in Iraq are reasonable. Um, I think there, there is a very impressive prime minister He's been very skillful in getting, you know, he got his security ministers approved 
uh, confirmed first, which was really quite striking. And they're very, very good, especially the Minister of Interior is a fine Minister of, uh, of, of Finance, Foreign Affairs, all, so he's got quite a good, he got his, uh, the most prominent counterterrorism commander is now the head of the counterterrorism service, uh, et cetera. He was the head of the intelligence uh, service in Iraq and understands that very, very well. He knows what the United States can provide in terms of uh, intelligence and, and battlefield enablers to keep the Islamic State down as now an insurgent and terrorist movement, uh, which it has reverted to being after being defeated as an army and still poses a very considerable threat, as you know. Uh, and he has dealt after a fashion uh, with some of the Shia militias supported by Iran uh, and with some of the very pernicious uh, effects uh, of those militias on the political process uh, in Iraq as well. He has acknowledged uh, the shortcomings of his government quite explicitly. Yeah. Again, the political nepotism or patronage uh, that is such a feature of the system, the bloated civil service, uh, the incompetent, the ineffectiveness is probably a better term. I mean, the, the irony that the land of the two rivers cannot provide fresh drinking water to its people and that one of the top three or four uh, countries with proven oil reserves can't provide 24 hour power to its, its uh, citizens is really uh, quite damning and quite yeah. striking. So, but there is potential. I think Iraq has enormous potential because of the blessings that it has. And let's not forget, it has changed government after generally free and fair democratic elections now a number of times. Uh, so again, I think it has uh, some substantial advantages that could enable uh, this prime minister, who of course is also uh, being quite firm about running the elections that are planned uh, for next year, I guess it is. But uh, so there is hope. Lebanon, I fear, I fear that Lebanon's underlying challenges are so substantial <clears throat> and are almost baked in um, that you have structural paralysis. Um, you now add to that a collapse of the currency, uh, which was a Ponzi scheme for a number of years, if not decades. And on top of that, of course, the massive, horrific, terrible uh, destruction of the port and many of the buildings near it, including the one that you were occupying that day when that explosion took place. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you have just seemingly intractable um, issues that divide the three major elements of the country, noting that yes, there is cooperation across lines and yes, they're not exclusively, uh, again, coalitions of just one uh, ethnicity or, or sect. So I, I, I see a very tough road for Lebanon ahead unless you can have the kind of extraordinary leadership that can both get the people to understand they have to take very tough measures to go forward uh, and have to further tighten their belts after all the privation that they have experienced and damage and so forth. Uh, and then also could somehow break through um, the arrangements that have for all of their many, many serious failings uh, at least prevented a return to the kind of civil war that were so terrible uh, several decades ago. So I find less optimism there, I'm afraid, and, I, and I, I, I hesitate to offer that to someone who is, again, Lebnuni, I guess it is. Um, and, <laughs> and yes, I'm sorry. Um, and, but it is a, I think it's a very, very dire situation. Uh, and it will take, again, above all, extraordinary leadership to try to bring together the different factions and pull them out of this situation. And um, you will know better than I if there is leadership out there ready uh, to come forward and to, to, to provide uh, the inspiration, the vision, 
uh, and the determination that is going to be necessary uh, to deal with a very, very serious set of circumstances. I'm afraid that I don't see such leadership. I see uh, the good old uh, cartel uh, running the country, uh, just absolutely running it down the, the drain, basically, and they just won't let go. It's unfair and, uh, to the people of Lebanon. It's unfair to the people of Libya, the people of Syria, the people of Iraq. Of Yemen, uh, what's going on in these countries uh, is, is, is not only the work of the outsiders, but also the insiders in, this, uh, in, in, in mo most of these countries, if not in all of them. Luckily, we have uh, good stories coming from the Gulf states. They are in a bit more of a normal life than we are in the Russian. But uh, I'm people hoping that, uh, uh, that the Biden administration will take a look at what was done right by the Trump administration. And if it was done right, we'll build on it because there's a lot of fear that, uh, that everything will drop, and that there will be an embrace of Iran no matter what. So on this note, I allowed myself to give my point of view. I took advantage of being the chair of this meeting. But uh, one last word to you. I don't want to have the last word, uh, David Petraeus, General Petraeus. Uh, do, do you want to tell me one thing that you feel good about that the Trump administration left us with or is leaving us with? Well, actually, I think the Trump administration can point to a number of achievements. Um, and in that region, um, I, would, I would certainly point to the Abraham Accords, as I have, have noted. I'd point to continuing the policy started by the previous administration with some improvements uh, to destroy the, uh, the Islamic State Caliphate. Um, and again, you can pick a number of other uh, initiatives, I think, around the world that they have had as well. Uh, although, sadly, we are seeing a handful of those undone uh, as we uh, hear of the reduction of forces in Afghanistan that is not apparently conditions-based, uh, a reduction in forces in Iraq that will, will not be as significant, uh, and hopefully not another reduction of forces in Syria. So I would go now to Dr. Jean Duke Anthony to thank him for giving me this uh, privilege of having this conversation with General Petraeus. General Petraeus, it really is fascinating listening to you always. I always learn from you. Grandes thank Ellen. You. Uh -huh. And I, I, I want to uh, congratulate you one more time, Dr. Jean Duke Anthony, for the success of your conference. Uh, as we say, inshallah, we meet, I, we will, uh, this too shall pass. What an honor both of you have uh, bestowed on me. I thank you very much and I turn it to you, Jean Duke Anthony. Goodbye, thank General. You, See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ravida. Thank you, General.